neurons. And Kosolino's point with using this term social synapse um, is that we have a parallel social network like our brains are. And uh, one of the issues that, that he uh, presents is that we can take a look at our function in a disordered or ordered way, in a complementary or, uh, or uh, obstreperous, obstructive way, just like the brain is ordered or disordered. That just like the social synapse changes with experience, so do the brain synapses change with experience. And that's going to be a very important thing for your clients to hear. Which brings us to the issue of nature versus nurture. Um, one of Kozolino's main points is that the brain is an organ of adaptation that facilitates its development and our own development in networks with others. So when you're interacting with your client, you're helping to bring about change in the client's brain. When you're, when you're interacting with yourself, just sitting there and thinking, or with your spouse or your children or your friends, you're affecting your brain because you're providing experience. And normally you're not doing it with intention. My hope is that as you move through this class, you'll start to be more intentional about what you do to your brain. So on, on the one hand, we have free will. On the other hand, we have determinism. Um, God gave us free will. There are people who insist on genetics indicating that things are deterministic. And I think we're, we, we exist along this continuum. The continuum is crossed by good versus evil. And we have, because we have free will, we can choose greater degrees of good versus evil. And we've all done that, and our clients do that. The adaptational capacity of the brain moves us towards the free will into things. I think it makes it very clear that when, when God granted us free will, he gave us a tremendous amount of responsibility that, that for many years I ignored. I'm now living life with intention. I invite you this semester to play with that idea of being more intentional about how you live your life, like I said when we first started. Actually taking a look at, at your adaptational capacity for your brain right now. The people with whom we meaningfully interact affect us just as we affect them, brain to brain. So when I, when I f first meet a client, I'm actually and doing my initial interview and starting to work on the diagnostic issues. I'm, I'm actually imagining that person's amygdala. <laughs> we'll talk about that a lot. And I, and I, you know, I hear the language, and, and there's, there's an edge of anger, and there's some fear in there, and I'm imagining an <coughs> overactive amygdala. And I adjust how I interact with her to start helping her be more comfortable in this safe space we call a counseling office. Which brings me to a thought that I had as I read Cozzolino about emotional intelligence. I'm going to call it IQE. Why is emotional intelligence so important? Because ad adaptation occurs in social interactions within communities. To the degree that we have good IQE, we're better at interacting with our fellows. And to the degree that we're where we practice interacting with our fellows, we develop our IQE. Emotion is the conscious manifestation of an unconscious process of evaluation that begins in the right brain and is labeled in the left brain. With regard to uh, racial stereotypes, when I was growing up, we had, in Los Angeles, we had every different racial and ethnic group had negative stereotypes about every other racial and ethnic group. And um, they were not based on actual experience because we didn't interact with each other. But if you ask somebody about how smart a particular group was or how hardworking a particular group was, people offered opinions. Were the opinions that were based in actual rational thought? No. They were pretty well-reasoned opinions, and there was a lot of um, good arguments to support them, but their genesis was in a negative feeling that whoever was being asked had about whatever 
racial or ethnic group he or she was being asked about. Guess who's better at recognizing the emotions on a face? Females. You read us better than we read you. The female's gonna, gonna appreciate more what's going on with the male than the male's gonna appreciate what's going on with the female. And, it, and it, it can be the kind of thing that all of a sudden just explodes and, and that left brain gets shut down by an overactive explosive amygdala so that the only thing that comes out are curse words or some physical uh, altercation. And, and that's just important to recognize. When we, when we work with a person who's got a problem with rage, mostly men, um, they aren't bad people. They're people who've gotten themselves, very often, gotten themselves in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that over several years have caused the parts of their brain that are reactive to be overdeveloped, literally overdeveloped and the parts of the brain that are inhibitory to be overwhelmed by that overdeveloped rage part of the brain. And counseling can help, but a lot of what needs to happen is, is some time for, I mean, we have to give the brain of that man some time to adjust. And it can adjust. He's not a bad person, but he does need some time because the brain is an, an adaptive organism that we actually have rewiring and new nerves coming online to help the person be a better husband or be a better father. And basically what we accept now is that neuroplasticity allows brain remodeling to reflect the individual's movement patterns. If we take a look at the parts of the brain that are responsible for movement, if you uh, exercise in a particular way, that part of the brain is going to be more developed. So for instance, it's been stu well studied with musicians. Musicians um, who have a particular uh, high level of demand for, for instance, fingering with the left hand, have much greater, um, for instance, a, a violinist, have much larger areas in their movement map, map on their right cerebral hemisphere than they do on the left because the left hand is doing tremendous fingering. The fingers are extremely important here and the right hand is not doing much in terms of fingering at all. It's just holding on and it's mostly uh, wrist. It's actually happening. This is happening in your brain right now. To the degree that you practice something, for instance, you've learned a few new words tonight. If you were to have a conversation after class about uh, neuroplasticity as a new term. And, and just talk with some friends about it, use the term half a dozen times yourself, hear it 20 times in your 15 minute conversation. Your brain is not gonna let go of neuroplasticity because you've been firing, 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 firing. Neurons have wired together. Neuron growth actually takes place tonight in your brain around the word neuroplasticity and the concept of neuroplasticity, okay? You can develop linkages, the, the neurons that fire together, wire together, that kind of get crowded. Neurons that aren't used get what are called pruned. And, but the pruning takes longer than the uh, wiring together. The other part of it that's important is that parts of the hippocampus, which we'll talk about a little bit tonight and a lot over the course of the semester, actually grow new neurons. But those neurons take about 21 days to go from a stem cell in the hippocampus to a, a full ready to go neuron that starts branching out. And so one of the things that I do with my clients when I give them homework is to tell them to expect change only if they stick with it for about a month. Because I'm anticipating that an important part of their brain development is this slow growing neurogenesis kind of thing that's separate but it adds to the neuroplasticity. Okay?